Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, a clinical microbiologist and the chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic and the president of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice in which we learn about updates in laboratory testing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Bill, welcome back. Great to talk to you this week. Yeah, it's a, another another week, another podcast chat. It's yes, times, exactly. All the way around. Yeah. So and now we're in summer. And so um, COVID thankfully is kind of right now, things are, are in, we're in a good place with numbers. And I'm starting to think about other things. As a, for instance, mm. I was in Northern Minnesota this weekend and I was clearing some long grasses and I started to think about tick-borne illnesses and, and the kind of things that people can get sick with and just wondering if I should ask you as yeah. a parasite gal, what <laughs> kind of things should I have done? I tell you what I did and you can tell me how wrong I was. I wore shorts. <laughs> I wore ankle mm. socks. I had bug repellent on my upper body only, and um, and 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 yeah, and then and that was so. I think I did some things wrong, and that's probably not a great idea. So, mm. well, you, you you did some things right. You probably just needed to extend them to the rest of your body. I say uh, cover all exposed skin or spray it with some sort of bug repellent that will repel ticks and mosquitoes. And, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency has a nice list of all the different options. So there's DEET, which is kind of your tried and true, but some people don't like DEET. There's also Picaridin. And then one of my favorites is uh, Oil of Lemon Eucalyptus, which has a, a EPA rating, which is almost as good as DEET. It's actually really good. So it's not oh. Citronella. It's actually a different product and you can buy it at your, you know, regular uh, stores, hardware stores, lots of places have it. So what did you do wrong? Let's see. I would have covered your legs with either insect repellent or wore long pants and tucked them, in, tucked them into your socks. Yeah. But I'm, I'm glad that you were thinking about it. I mean, I guess that's the first step, right? Even being aware of the risks. Well, yeah, I think so. And I, maybe that's a good thing for us to talk about because, you know, I think that the pandemic has just made people kind of, of course, with mask wearing and everything, start to think about just that one pathogen and things we need to do to protect mm. ourselves. I, you know, and of course, because it was all over the place, it was affecting everyone's lives. But I mean, I think there are some really serious illnesses that people can get from, from ticks and other biting insects that we probably need to be aware of, correct? Yeah, absolutely, Bill. You know, let's just talk about those briefly. Uh, first of all, uh, tick-borne, mosquito-borne diseases, those did not go away with COVID. So even though that's all we've been talking about the past year and a half or so, we actually saw our numbers for tick-borne disease testing go up last year. Um, mm -hmm. And we're certainly now seeing very high numbers of, of specimens coming into the laboratory of positive results. So when we think of things that are transmitted by a vector, like a mosquito or a tick, so when we think of things that are transmitted by biting things, vectors like ticks and mosquitoes, we usually think of Lyme disease, which would be big because that is the number one vector-borne disease in the United States, uh, much more than West Nile virus or anything transmitted by a mosquito. So tick-borne disease. But then, yeah, there, like you said, there are other serious things transmitted by ticks and mosquitoes. We have anaplasmosis, babesiosis. We're in Minnesota, a hotbed for tick-borne diseases, especially in northern Minnesota where you were. So you should be thinking about protecting yourself from ticks and mosquitoes probably every time you go outside. Um, you know, other hot spots in the United States, though, like the upper Northeast, they also have to worry about Lyme disease, babesiosis, anaplasmosis. Other parts of the country, we have Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, ehrlichiosis. So, yeah, there's a whole host of things that uh, essentially I just tell everyone, protect yourself from biting bugs. Uh, we have the, the ABCs of ticks and tick-borne diseases that I usually talk about. A is avoid, avoid the areas where they are if possible, although you know, you're gonna wanna go outside someday. So uh, probably also then knowing the risky areas. Um, there's some things you could do just like avoiding the tall grasses. You know, If you're hiking, stay in the middle of the trail. Uh, of course, if, what were you doing? You were probably clearing. clearing just clearing, yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so, so a choice there. So not much avoiding going on there. Uh, so now you, <laughs> <laughs> now you move on to the protecting part. Uh, B of the ABCs, B is bug spray. So wearing that D, which is good, you put it on your upper body, just, you know, extend it down to any exposed skin. And C is cover up. So if you can stand it, if it's not unbearably hot, like some parts of the world are, uh, some parts of our country uh, right now, then I would say cover up, you know, you cover the skin, bugs can't get to it. So, uh, you know, ticks are going to crawl on you looking for exposed skin. And if you have long pants on and you've tucked them into your socks, well, then that's less skin that they can get access to. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's, and as you were saying, it actually, it's really, I'm glad we're doing this and talking about this, not just from my own edification, but also uh, because actually we've seen, so in Northern Minnesota, where I go, it's been much busier the last couple of years, many more people are using the boundary waters yeah. and, and, and visiting um, because of, without as much travel, visiting our, our beautiful country. But at the same point in time, that does that, that could well explain the increase in tests and the increase in positives that people, people are out there. And they need yeah. to be aware of this. These are serious illnesses, to your point. And the other thing is just to be, if you know, if you do come back from a trip like that, all of these to wa really watch for where you might have been bitten, watch for ticks. You know, Lyme disease is best caught early. If you don't treat it early, it's a problem. The other thing is to really be thoughtful because a lot of these diseases are very difficult to treat. Babesiosis, others, they, they're, not, uh, they're not straightforward in, in treatment. Some, and, um, and last but not least, if you've been visiting in one of those areas and know someone who has, isn't feeling well, to, to make sure they get to a, to a care provider or physician um, and let them know of what they've been doing because these diseases are actually very difficult for people to diagnose. We see them, and you probably see them in your lab because, and people calling you, I'm sure, because many, many physicians don't have a lot of experience with these, I think, right? Well, right. And testing uh, options are numerous, so people can be confused. We use serology detection of antibodies to detect a lot of these, but we have to remember that it takes a while for your body to build up antibodies to a level that can be detected. So early on, uh, your serology tests, which is the gold standard for Lyme disease, you, we know that those would be negative early on. And a lot of people with Lyme disease, uh, somewhere between 60 to 80% will have a very characteristic rash called a, a bullseye erythema migrans rash at the site of the tick bite. But if that rash is not there, well, then you may not have any idea that you've been bitten. Um, or if it's in a part of your body that you may not see, like your scalp under your hair or on your back. And uh, even people that have that classic rash sometimes don't even know that they have it. So I think the important thing, like you said, is if you're not feeling well, go to your doctor, tell them that you are out and potentially exposed to ticks. I would say in the highly endemic areas, uh, physicians and other providers should be thinking about this. Good, you know, yeah. in the summertime, it gets a little trickier at the beginning, at the end of the season, but we are definitely in peak season now. So hopefully everyone, this should be on everyone's mind. Yeah, I think the, in the bottom line, two things came to mind. Number one, also think about your pets. My daughter is really into going in the boundary waters. She's really mm -hmm. good about making sure her dog is protected because the dogs can get sick. Your pets can get sick, number one. Yep. Number two, they can transmit it. They carry tick back to you. So you have to really check yourselves and your, and your animals carefully. And the other is really thinking about all the conversations we had around masking and COVID. I think for a lot of people that this was seem so new that we're asking everyone to do something to help keep themselves protected. But actually, it's a mainstay of good medical practice and just good safety practice is to protect yourself from infections. It's much better. An ounce of prevention is worth the yes. pound of cure, as they say. <laughs> so it's important to keep these things in mind if people out there are hopefully enjoying. I mean, the, the upside is that people gain an appreciation of, of, of the beauty of creation around us and so help to preserve it for other generations. But the flip side is we need to keep ourselves safe. And I'm glad we talked about it because no one wants to get sick and uh, no, and ticks are creepy. I, you know, yeah. yeah, they're just kind of creepy anyways. To me. <laughs> they definitely are. You know, as someone who studies ticks, uh, I talk about the proper way to remove a tick, which we could talk about briefly. But uh, even me, I saw one on me the other day and my instinctive reaction was like, ah, get it off me, get it off me. <laughs> and I <laughs> flung it off of me and I was in my kitchen and then I thought, oh no. Now I have a tick crawling around my kitchen. So, you know, sometimes you just can't 
prevent your natural human nature response to something creepy and crawly on you. Um, but briefly, if you do find a tick embedded yeah. on you, um, don't panic like I did. Um, just you want to remove it as quickly as possible. Fine tipped tweezers or forceps if you have them are the best way. And you just want to grasp it close to the skin as possible and then just slowly pull it out in a continuous motion, kind of at an angle, the way the tick is embedded. Um, what you don't want to do is twist it. You don't want to increase the risk that the mouth parts are going to be stuck in your skin. And you don't want to do things like try to smother it with Vaseline or burn it with a match. Those are kind of your old folklore uh, methods. That's just going to possibly irritate the skin and irritate the tick and maybe even increase your risk of getting something transmitted from the tick. So just pull it off. I tell people put it in a plastic bag, especially if it's been um, attached to you for a long period of time, meaning it's like really swollen and engorged, or you know it's been a few days since you've been exposed. Um, and that way uh, you can consider bringing it to your physician. If it's been attached for more than 36 hours in high endemic areas, sometimes there is an indication to have an antibiotic. So you could go to your physician. Got it. So Got it. I'll end Got with it. a couple of... Uh, just like things that I've learned, um, we've already talked about, you know, the ABCs of ticks, but important what you said about your animals, you can bring your pets to the vet and they can actually get little drops, which makes me wonder why we can't just, you know, put drops on us. <laughs> I think whoever invents that will, you know, have a, a great business there. Um, so check your pets, but also get a tick buddy check to check, you know, you can check each other for ticks. So you can look at the places that are hard to see, hard to reach. Um, and then one last thing that I do is I actually will even prepare in advance. So say if I'm up at my cabin, which happens to be in Wisconsin, another highly endemic area for tick-borne diseases, I'll actually hang my clothes up the night before and douse them with permethrin, which you can sp spray directly on clothing and gear. And it doesn't break down plastics like DEET does. Let it dry, completely odorless. The next day, I put on my clothes, and they're my my woods clothes. Oh and wow! Yeah, and it and they actually are um, acaricides and insecticides. They'll kill ticks on contact. So just that extra layer of protection. All That's these different things idea. you could do. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, I'm just glad. I'm glad that uh, my parents used to use a match method, and that's oh, yeah. <laughs> it's always a little scary. So that's. Uh, yeah, it's good to know that's not the preferred way. Vaseline just makes it messy and you end up having to pull it out anyway. So Well, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, sure, you could smother it, but the, the goal is to get it off of you as soon as possible. And if you're going to smother it, that takes time. Yep. Wow. So lots of good stuff. <laughs> and and uh, really, and you're the expert. And so I'm so good at talking about it. So and very yeah. timely. So um, I guess that'll do it for this week. We'll be back to, to uh, I'm sure we got, we'll have more to talk about as always, but hopefully, uh, I don't know if we'll have one. I will be coming up on a holiday week, perhaps when this is out. So hopefully people listen to this around the fourth. You're staying safe in many ways, fireworks, pathogens, biting bugs, everything else, and, uh, yep. and enjoying your, your, the holiday weekend. So yeah. thanks, Be Bobby. safe, but get out there and enjoy yourselves. Okay, talk to you later, Bill. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.